Hi everyone, we are now going to take a look at chapter eight on individual income tax computation and tax credits. Thank Ella. So our learning objectives are we're going to calculate the regular tax liability again. You did, you, I'm um, trying to think now maybe in chapter one, we didn't get through chapter one. So we're gonna take a look at calculating that. We're going to look at the taxpayer's alternative minimum tax liability. How do we determine that? How do we determine a net investment income tax and the employment and self-employment taxes? Then we're gonna look at some tax credits that are allowed by our income tax system, child tax credit, child and dependent care credit, the American Opportunity and Lifetime Learning credits and earned income credit. And then finally, we're going to talk about how we compute underpayment by um, payment penalties, late filing and late payment penalties. So to bring us back, when we know our filing status, and we covered that again in chapter four, married filing jointly, qualifying widow or widower, married filing separately, head of household or single, and we know our taxable income, we can then calculate our income tax. Now, again, we have a progressive tax rate system as income increases, so does tax rates. And those are found in the back of your book in Appendix D. I'm sorry, Appendix C. Appendix C, it's all the way in the back, right before one of the indexes. And it's like a blue page and it has the tax rates, tax rates schedule for 2021 in it. And then there's some other information on the next page, it looks like. So we're on C1. So that's what you would be using to calculate your um, income taxes. Now, currently the tax brackets are 10%, 12%, 22, 24, 32, 35, and 37. I know there's um, some grumbling out there in the news that um, the Democrats in the House are looking to um, revise the tax code, increase corporate tax rate from 21% to 26.5% and tax the highest income earners at a 39% tax rate or highest taxable income individuals. And I believe they're looking at people who have taxable income of five, you know, that's the companies. I think $450,000 or more in taxable income. Don't quote me on that. I'm just trying to remember from memory. I didn't write it down. So there could be more tax changes coming. <laughs> uh, they probably will. New administration, new political party in charge. That's what's going to happen. Now, if you look on page C1 in the back of your book, you'll see that our tax rate schedules are broken down by um, filing status. So that's the first thing we need to find, our taxpayer's filing status. And then we calculate their tax based on their taxable income. And as you can see there, as taxable income increases, so does the tax rate for that particular um, range of income. So we're going to go through calculating one in a few, few seconds here. Now, there are some exceptions to the basic tax computation. If a taxpayer has a long-term capital gain, so they're, and after netting together all their capital gains, long and short term, they end up with a long-term capital gain. It is taxed at preferential rates. And I'll give you the page for those incomes. Okay, let's see here. Let's see. Okay, so on page C-2, C-2, the next page after your tax rate schedule. I'm sorry, I thought it was in chapter eight. They've moved it. Um, it says tax rates for net capital gains and qualified dividends. 
So if your taxable income, okay, is in these ranges, based on your filing status, the leftmost rate will be your preferential rate on long-term capital gains and qualified dividends. So it notes there that two different tax rates can occur on one dividend. What does this mean? Well, remember dividends are always ordinary, always, but they may also be considered qualified. A dividend is considered qualified if it's basically paid from a domestic corporation, a United States-based corporation. If it is qualified or a part of it is qualified, that part is taxed at preferential rates, normally lower than our regular tax rate. Okay, so what they mean there is that you may receive a dividend, part of it may be qualified, part of it may not. Now, before we move to the kitty tax, let's see this in action a little bit. So I'm going to direct you to your book and I'm going to ask you to go to page, see it, 8-4, 8-4, example 8-3. Okay, so we have here, Courtney's taxable income is 145,070. It includes 700 of qualified dividends. What is her tax liability on her taxable income? Okay, so I believe the assumption is Courtney is a head of household. So let's see. I'm going to go back to C2. Her filing status is head of household and her taxable income is between 54,101 and 473,750. So her preferential rate on the Qualified dividend is 15%. So let me go back then to that example. It's hard for me to, oh wait, maybe I could hit this thing and it'll take me back. There we go. Okay. So $700 will be taxed at 15% or $105. Calculator, they're gone. We'll subtract that $700 from her normal taxable income and then compute income tax on the remaining $144,370. So I'm going to go, you, you can't see me doing this, but I'm going over to the Appendix C, find the head of household tax rate schedule. And notice how you read this is. If taxable income is over the first column, but not over the second column. So her taxable income is 145,000 around there, 144 something. So it appears her taxable income lies between 86,350 row and 164,900 under head of household. So she'll use the rule to the most right there to calculate her income tax on the rest of her income. So she'll take 13,293 and add to that the amount her taxable income is above the 86,350 times 24%. That's what that rule says. So let me go back to where I was and we'll show you that. So you see her taxable income that will be taxed using the tax rate schedules is 144,370. Subtract the lower end of that brackets range, 86,350. 44,370 minus 86,350. And you get 58,020. Multiply that result by 24%. So only that much of her income is being taxed at 24%. Add that result to the 13,293, and you get $27,217.80.
So the tax on just her taxable income subject to ordinary rates is 27,218. Her tax on the qualified dividends at preferential rates is 105. Add those two together, her tax on total taxable income, 27,323. So essentially in the next question, they say, how much did she save because she had that $700 taxed at a 15% rate? Well, if she didn't have a tax at 15%, it would have been taxed at 24%. So she saved $63 in income taxes by having that preferential rate. Okay, and you can take a look at the other examples there. So you wanna make sure you know how to calculate the income tax using that Appendix C, whether it be regular ordinary tax rates or those preferential rates. Post any questions you might have on that. The next area of your chapter talks about what's called the kitty tax. And this has been around for a long time, but we compute it differently. Every, they always change it up on us. What, it, what the kitty tax is, is essentially for um, children who meet certain qualifications who have excess unearned income. So that would be interest, dividends, capital gains. So their income is not related to them working and earning the money. When this occurs on children who meet the qualification, their unearned income could actually be taxed at their parents' last tax rate or marginal rate. Who qualifies? Well, if the child is under age 18 at the year end and their unearned income on their tax return is above $2,200, this will apply. If the child is 18 at year end, but earned income is not greater than half of the child's support, this would qualify if their unearned income is $2,200 or more. If the child is over age 18, but under age 24 at year end is a full-time student and the child's, un I'm sorry, the child's earned income is not greater than half of the child's support and the child has more than 2,200 of unearned income, this kitty tax will apply. So take a look. Let me uh, go backwards here. All right, sorry about that. It looks like the PowerPoint's messed up there a little bit. Let me go to your book then and take a look at example 8-4 on page 8-6. This is a great example of unearned income and the kitty tax. Suppose during 2021, Duran, who is Courtney's son, received 5,200 in interest from an IBM bond. And he received another 2,100 in interest income from a money market account, account that his parents have been contributing to over the years. Is Duran potentially subject to the kitty tax? Now, somewhere in prior examples, we determined Duran is younger than 18 at the end of the year. And his net unearned income exceeds 2,200. His net unearned income is the 5,200 in interest and the 2,100 on the money market. So what is Duran's taxable income and corresponding tax liability? Now this is how he would prepare and determine information on his tax return. First of all, his gross income, assuming these are the only two sources of income is $7,300, the 5,200 in interest, and the 2100 on the interest on the um, money market. His standard deduction. This takes us back to our discussion on standard deduction. Since he can be claimed as a dependent on his parents' tax return, that's the assumption here. His standard deduction is the greater of $1,100 or earned income plus 350. Well, he has no under, he has no earned income. So $350 or $1,100, the greater is $1,100, so his standard deduction is $1,100. Okay. 
his taxable income is 6,200. Okay. Now, how do we figure out his tax? Well, the first thing we do is say, how much unearned income does Duran have above $2,200? So that would be the 7,300 of unearned income minus 2,200, $5,100. Which is lower, his taxable income or that result? That result, which would be 5,100. Now, Courtney's marginal tax rate is 24%. Courtney is his mother. 5,100 of Duran's taxable income is going to be taxed at 24% because it's considered, this is the kitty tax. So $1,224 is his tax so far, but that is only tax on 5,100. The remaining $1,100 of his taxable income is taxed at Duran's normal tax rate, which would be a single person, and it would be 10%. So his total tax will be $1,224 plus 110 or $1,334, and that will be on Duran's tax return. Because his unearned income was more than 2,200 and he meets one of the tests for a child who would have the applicable kitty tax calculated, this is how his income tax would be calculated. And you can run through the next example to see how to calculate that amount, because now they're dealing with preferential tax rates in that example. Please post any questions you may have. The next area of your book talks about what's called the net investment income tax. This is a 3.8% tax imposed on investment income. And it's imposed on the lesser of net investment income, and that's defined there, or the amount your modified adjusted gross income is above a threshold dependent on your filing status. So, we go to the next page in our book and we'll take a quick look at that. Where is that? E-tax? Hmm, I'm missing it here. I think your PowerPoints are out of whack here a little bit. Let me see if there's an example here. Okay, there's the kitty tax. Wait, I didn't go through these before I started using them, as you can tell. That's just showing what we just went through. And of course, they don't have um, an example for the net investment tax. Let me go find this here. Just bear with me a second. I should have been better prepared. <laughs> I know this stuff, so I could teach it, but I want to find the examples. I should have been prepared for those. Okay, we may come back. We're probably going to have to come back to that net investment income tax. Just Put that on the side burner. Let's move on to alternative minimum tax. The alternative minimum tax is pretty deceiving. It's not that you have the lowest tax, it's really the highest tax. It's like saying, well, this is your minimum tax. And essentially what it is, is there to penalize higher income individuals and making sure that they're paying their fair share of taxes because they might have been able to take advantage of a tax law that allowed them to pay less money in taxes. So how we calculate it, it's, you still do your tax return, a 1040, but then you do a separate schedule, a 6251, to see if you are subject to this additional tax. And how we calculate it is we take your regular taxable income. So you have to have your tax return done and you still do one. 
you add back for this calculation, your standard deduction. If you took your standard deduction in computing your normal income tax. You add back other adjustments or subtract them and they're very unique items. And in your book, they are listed on page 8-9. For instance, if you were able to exclude tax exempt interest on a special kind of investment, it's called a private activity bond, you must include it for purposes of calculating this tax. Now, if you're sitting there going, well, how do I know if my, my client has this private activity bond interest? It's actually on their 1099 INT. So um, the person or the company, um, it's usually the government, is providing the 1099, will indicate whether the tax-free interest was on, on a private activity bond or not. Um, other things you need to add in or subtract. If you itemized your deductions, you need to add back any type of real and personal property taxes you deducted as an itemized deduction. They're added back. So certain itemized deductions are allowed and certain ones are not. State income or sales tax, if you deducted that as an itemized deduction, you need to add that back here. Things you could subtract are special um, depreciation for AMT purposes. We're not going to get into that. Um, if you included a state income tax refund on your normal 1040, you can subtract it here for AMT purposes. Okay, so there's special items. There's some common items and then there's some really unique items that needed to be added or subtracted. And once you sub add or subtract all those adjustments to your regular taxable income, you now have what's called the alternative minimum taxable income. You are allowed to subtract an AMT exemption amount and that's based on filing status. And that is on page 8-11 of your book. And the exemption amounts are listed there. Now, once your alternative minimum taxable income gets to a certain level, it starts to phase out. And they give you those phase out ranges. So if you're married filing jointly, once your alternative minimum taxable income is at $1,505,600, $1,505,600, $5,600, you don't get an AMT exemption amount to subtract. But if you're allowed one, you subtract it and you get to your tax base for AMT. Now, depending on what that tax base is, okay, and this is on page 8-12, you calculate AMT tax on the first $199,900 of AMT alternative minimum tax base is taxed at 26%. 26%. Amounts above that are taxed at 28%. You'll apply those rates and that will give you what we call your tentative minimum tax. This isn't saying if this is lower than your regular tax, ooh, you get to just pay that amount. No, what it's saying is if the tentative minimum tax is above the normal income tax you just calculated on your 1040, the difference you must pay as an alternative minimum tax. So not only are you going to pay the tax you computed like we did a couple minutes ago, but now you have this additional amount of, to add on. And that's what alternative minimum tax is. My taxpayers with large amounts of capital gains. And here are those items. We already went over these. 
are added back when we're computing all our alternative minimum taxable income. You must add in tax exempt interest that you did not include yet in taxable income from private activity bonds. If you itemized, instead of taking the standard deduction, add back your state and local income tax taxes and real property taxes. Once you get to your alternative minimum taxable income, you can then subtract an exemption amount, assuming you're allowed to. You phase out over a range. As far as your um, PowerPoint goes. Oh, just let me have some laps here and see. <laughs> okay, hold on a second. I gotta, I'm gonna still share this with you. I find this hilarious sometimes the way they go through these. Like, what are you doing? Okay. All right. So I'm going to take you to the book. And actually, let me call your book up here and I'll share that with you. I forgot. <laughs> I've been um, doing it through my other computer and really I should call it up here. So let's take a good look at this calculation. So we're all on the same page. I'll share that with you momentarily. Bear with me. All right, There's your book, and let me get to chapter eight and alternative minimum tax. Okay. So this is our discussion of it, but I, I wanted to run through it. There's the 60, I didn't do that. My computer did, isn't that something? The 6251, that's the form that would need to be completed to calculate and it would be attached to the 1040. But let's take a look at this example, 8.5. Oh, let's go backwards so that we could see all of the stuff Courtney has been doing. Oh, come here. Courtney continued to work on her AMT com computation by determining other adjustments she needs to make to determine her alternative minimum taxable income. So first of all, and they give you the exhibits over on the right. So if you all wanna go back and see where these came from, but we already saw Courtney has taxable income in total of 145.070. In example 522, Courtney is that taxpayer that goes through the whole book. So she actually did have $500 of tax exempt interest from a private activity bond. So that's something she's going to add back. In her itemized deductions in example 6-13, she was able to deduct $10,000 of state and local income taxes and um, sales taxes that are not allowed for purposes of calculating alternative minimum tax. She also had included on her original taxable income a state income tax refund, so she can deduct that now. So adding and subtracting those changes will give her an alternative minimum taxable income of 155, 150. Now she's head of household and her AMTI is below 523, 600. So Courtney can take a $73,600 exemption. Now, if her AMTI here was above 523,600, she would need to reduce her exemption 25 cents for every dollar above the 523,600. So that means, by the time her income reaches five, um, 818,000, yeah, she would have completely phased out the 73,600, but she's cool. She can deduct the exemption amount of 73,600 from her AMTI, number one above. So her AMT base is 81,550. So they're just showing you in the next example how we would phase out. Look at it. What if her AMTI is 700,000? Well, 
take 700,000 minus the lower end of the phase out, which would be, whoops, 700 minus 523, 600 for her filing status. This gives her 176, 400. 25 cents of every one of dollar of that is 44,100. So of the 73,600 that would be allowed, she needs to reduce it by 44,100. So her exemption amount is only 29,500 in that scenario. Let's keep going. Let's go back to where, okay, her AMT base is 81,500. Now she does have preferential dividends, which are still taxed at her preferential rates. The remaining amount, the 80,850 is below 199,900. So all of that will be taxed at 26%. So what's her total tentative minimum tax? 105, right up here, plus the 21,021, 21,126. Now, what we do is we say, well, here's her calculation from that process, and here's her regular tax. Since her regular tax is above the, the amount we just computed, the tentative minimum tax, she just pays her 27,323 of regular tax. An additional amount would have to be paid if the calculation in part one was above 27,323. So not only would she pay the 27,323, but then the additional amount that was above that, um, that dollar amount because the tentative minimum tax was greater. And that's what alternative minimum tax is. Okay, so um, it's just a quick overview of it. it um, but just so you know, there could be an additional tax, just like there could, we do special computation for kitty tax beyond our regular income tax. So I'm gonna stop sharing that and go back to my PowerPoint here. What happened to my PowerPoint? It's gone. I must've closed it down. So just bear with me while I get that back up. Manu, PowerPoint. Yeah. All right. Okay, and I'm going to go back to where we left off. All righty. So let's. Go to self-employed individuals. Let me just make sure I'm not missing anything here. Yes, I am. See, good thing I, okay. All right, let's go there. Okay, so what we need to remember is that when we are employees, we pay social security up to a certain dollar amount of our gross pay we have calculated 6.2% and it changes each year. In 2021, it looks like 6.2% of the first $142,800 of gross pay is paid towards social security. Once your gross pay is above that point in 2021, you stop paying the tax. All of your wages are subject to a 1.45% Medicare tax rate. And for people in, um, where their salaries or wages are in excess of 200,000, 250 for married filing joint, you pay an additional 0.9% in additional Medicare tax. Now, if you're an employer, you match those for each employee. So as an employee relationship, you pay one part of the overall FICA taxes and the employer pays the other part. That doesn't happen with self-employed individuals. And we talked a little bit about this. Self-employed individuals are responsible for not only the employee share, but also the employer share and additional Medicare tax. How do they calculate it? Their tax base is net earnings from self-employment, which is 
their net profits on all of their Schedule Cs. So this is an individual. It's not husband and wife put their amounts together. Husband's all of his Schedule Cs or spouse Schedule Cs. Spouse one and spouse two collects all of their profits from their Schedule Cs. And that's them all together and multiplies that result by 0.9235. That is your net earnings from self-employment. Then you calculate your social security and Medicare tax applying the same limits to net earnings from self-employment. But instead of calculating them based on, you know, 6.2 and 1.45, they would be calculated um, 12.4% for Social Security and 2.9% for Medicare. Okay. Now, if net earnings from self employment are less than $400, you do not have to calculate any tax. Okay. How do you calculate self employment if you also work and have money from a job as an employee? Okay, and we're going to take you through some examples here to show you that. Assume Courtney received $100,000 of taxable comp compensation from her employer in 2021. Now, what you need to remember is Courtney's employer withheld Social Security and Medicare on that $100,000 of taxable compensation. They're required to, and they've also matched it out of their own pocket. In addition, she received $180,000 in self-employment income from her side business. What is her self-employment taxes and additional Medicare tax on her $180,000 of business income? Now, we assume that Courtney's employer did correctly withhold $6,200 of Social Security tax, 6.2%, and 1.45% of Medicare tax, and no additional Medicare tax because of her income level. Take a look. The first thing we do is go, okay, since Courtney already has paid Social Security and Medicare from her normal job, is all 180,000 of her self-employment income subject to Social Security and Medicare tax? Well, let's first look at Social Security. Her social security that's already been paid in is 100,000. The total amount of income she needs to pay social security tax from all sources, whether it be her self-employment or her job is 142,800. She's already paid 100,000 on, on uh, or already has paid tax on 100,000 of it. So she still needs to pay social security tax on $42,800 of income on her self-employment income. Now, I'm sorry, her net earnings from self-employment would be the 180,000 times 92.35%. So that number they gave us in the example did not um, take into account that she that 92.35% yet. So how much is her social security on self-employment? Well, it's the lesser of one or two. So we take the 42,800 and multiply that result by 12.4%. So her self-employment tax so far is $5,307 for social security from her self-employment income. Medicare tax is calculated on number two because all income is subject to Medicare tax but she pays 2.9% because it's self-employment income that um, we're calculating the Medicare tax on, or 4821. So let's keep going. Now let's take a look if she has to pay tax on um, the additional Medicare tax of 0.9%. Right now, her compensation and net earnings from self-employment are 266, 230, 100,000 in gross pay plus the net earnings from self employment in step two. Based on her filing status, 
we take that 266, 230 minus her filing status limit of 200,000. So income above 200,000 is subject to an additional 0.9% Medicare tax. Multiply that, $596. Her employer didn't withhold any additional Medicare tax on her earnings. So her total self-employment tax will be the 10,128 from step three four, and seven, and $596 of additional Medicare tax. A total of $10,724. So how much is her self-employment tax on her self-employment income? $10,724. Now we have to do this calculation because she is employed and self-employed. But if she was just self-employed, um, let's do this. I'm gonna go ahead out to a Word document. So we wanna get those same facts about Courtney. I'm still sharing there. But let's say she just had $180,000 in self-employment income. Jotting that down. I'm going to go ahead out to a Word document and share that with you or an Excel. Let's see if I can get something to come up here for me. I'll get my stop sharing this and do this and then see if I can get a menu. There we go. And I'll share this. I'll do it in Excel. Okay. And it comes Excel. Open that up. Oh, come on, you. Still opening, so just give it a second. Okay, now let me share that with you guys. All right. Okay, so I have a little Excel spreadsheet here. So we have on her, let's see if I can get this to be bigger. I'm working on my laptop and I just am terrible with the mouse. I don't have my portable mouse, my old fashioned one. <laughs> it's just so hard for me to do stuff. <laughs> ah, okay, I'm just gonna do this. So her self-employment income right now is 180,000. Now, remember, her net self-employment is what we calculate self-employment tax on, and that would be the 180,000 times 0.9265. I think it's 35. Hold on. 9235. Okay. So how much would be her social security on that? Well, again, we would take limit already is 142 800 so we would say okay the first 142,000 800 dollars is subject to a 12.4 percent tax so 142 800 times 0.124 so there's her self social security portion of self-employment. On Medicare, all of the net self-employment is subject to Medicare tax. And that would be 2.9%. Remember, it's double because she's considered employee and employer. 30 times 0.029. Now, since she... Um, her self-employment income here is less than, her net self-employment is less than $200,000. She is not subject to the additional 0.9% Medicare. So these two numbers would be added together. Oh, yeah, yeah, I am batting a thousand here. There we go. 
her total self-employment income. Now, remember, she would still do her regular tax return and calculate income tax. This is just the FICA Medicare portion of her tax because it's not paid in during the year like an employee employer has is $22,528. Okay, so I just wanted to, to see that. And now I'll go back to the PowerPoint and we'll keep going. It, but it's in an yep. okay all right so now we have to determine whether a taxpayer is an employer or independent contractor and a lot of times people out there um employers are really employers but they'll call the people they hire independent contractors and um the irs is aware of this and so they have a, a pretty detailed test if an employer tries to call someone an independent contractor, that they truly are an independent contractor. And the big question is who has control over, uh, over the, the person, um, when they work, where they work, how work is performed. That's really gonna determine if they are an employee or an employer. <laughs> I can get the forward. Come on. All right, so that's our discussion on additional taxes and computing taxes. Now let's talk about tax credits. And there's tax credits put into three different categories, non-refundable. So that means if your tax credit is greater than your tax liability, you just lose the extra tax credit. However, refundable tax credits mean if your tax credit is greater than your tax liability, you get that extra money back. And then there's business ones, which we're really not going to get into. I just want to give you an overview here. Non-refundable personal credits, um, child tax credit, but some of it is refundable. It is up to $2,000 for each qualifying child under 17 at the end of the year who is claimed as a taxpayer's dependent, okay? And it's actually $3,600 Okay, it's three thousand dollars. I'm sorry, three thousand dollars in 2021 only, and it could be up to forty six hundred dollars in 2021 or thirty six hundred dollars thereafter if the child is under age six. There are income limits. Some of this could be refundable. It's normally non refundable, but some of it can be partially. It's I'm sorry. It's generally refundable in 2021 because of the pandemic, It's just the one year, and then it's going to go to partially refundable. Now, remember, this has to be a qualifying child, and they have to be under 17. If the dependent is any other type of dependent, then it's $500. And that's basically it for that. If you, let's see, here. Take a look at the examples of this in your book and just post any kind of questions. The next type of non-refundable credit is for child and dependent care, okay? So this is when you're paying someone to care for your child or dependent and because you need to go out and work, okay? And that's the key. Somebody needs to be working here or going to school full-time. So we have a dependent under age 13 who needs care Age doesn't matter if they're a disabled dependent. The amount of the credit is based on the amount of the taxpayer's expenditures to provide care for one or more qualifying persons. Now, these numbers were way lower, and recently they've been increased significantly. So the expenditures that qualify are up to $8,000 for one qualifying person or $16,000 if you have two or more dependents in this situation. The percentage used to calculate the credit is based on a taxpayer's AGI. And there it is. Okay, so if your AGI is $125,000 or less, up to 50% of your eligible expenses can be used as a 
child and dependent care credit. This changed significantly also. These percentages used to be much lower. And then it gradually decreases as your AGI increases, as you can see there. I'll give you an example. In the PowerPoint, why would they do that? So this chapter is terrible with it. Um, I'd like you to go to page, looks like we can go on page 827 for an example, example 8-19. I'm not gonna get out of the PowerPoint. You can go there on your book. Um, suppose that this year, Courtney paid a neighbor $10,000 to care for her 10-year-old son, Duran, so Courtney could work. And that's the key. You know, if one parent is staying home and they just ask somebody to babysit for them so they can go, you know, and just get out of the house and be away from the, their child for a little bit, that doesn't qualify. So uh, somebody needs to, you know, one or both parents need to work depending on the household and or go to school for a certain, you know, that qualifies as well. Um, would Courtney be able allowed to claim the child and dependent care credit? Well, yes. Courtney paid for Duran's care to allow her to work. Duran is a qualifying person because he's under 13. What amount, if any, could she claim for the $10,000 she spent? Well, here's how we look at it. We compare three amounts, the actual dependent care expenditure, the limit that's given by law. So since she only has one child who falls under this, one dependent, it's the most expenditures she can use to calculate this is $8,000. And we also compare her earned income, which is given. So it's the lowest of those three amounts. So in step four, we say, okay, $8,000 is what she can use to calculate the credit. Now, where does her AGI fall in that table, which was up in here, up in the top of your book? So since her income is in the $183,000 to $400,000 range, sorry, let's see. her AGI, I mean, her AGI, yes, 20% is the rate she can use. So the total credit she can take is $1,600. That is how that is calculated. Compare the three amounts and then determine the percentage she can use to calculate the credit based on AGI. Now, if her in earned income, her AGI was only 30,500, she would be able to use 50%. So her non-refundable credit would be $4,000. That's in the next example. So that's the child and dependent care credit. The last or the next credit is the American Opportunity Tax Credit, which is an education credit. To qualify, the, um, you must, the dependent is in their first four years of school. I don't mean they've been a freshman for four years. No, their first four years of their freshman year are all that qualify then, <laughs> okay? Um, these are only for eligible expenses and institutions only. So you could take a read through that, but basically it's tuition fees and books and they have to be uh, an allowed institution. So you're looking at colleges here, or trade schools. This is a per student credit. So if you have more than one dependent, in this situation, in their first four years of school, and they have eligible expenses, then you can calculate this credit for each of the dependents. And it is the person who claims the dependent who gets the tax credit. How much is the credit? It's 100% of the first 2,000 eligible expenses, and then 25% of the next 2,000 of eligible expenses. So what we're talking about here are amounts paid out of pocket or through loans or grants that have to be paid back. Okay, so a student is in their first year of school, they take a student loan and parents pay some money out of pocket, add those two together. The first 2,000 of that amount, you get a 100% tax credit, 25% of the next 2,000 is added to that. You do have a phase out because of AGI, and part of that credit is refundable, meaning 
if when you calculate this credit, your tax liability is less, you may be able to get part of it refunded to you, which is not normally what happens with non-refundable credits. So there's some examples in your book for you to run through with those. The second education credit is called the lifetime learning credit. The lifetime learning credit is a per taxpayer credit. So what we do here is we take eligible expenses, basically tuition or coursework, okay, even if it's to improve your job. So you don't have to be going for a degree. This is for people outside that four years of education. So you're in graduate school or professional school, you're doing continuing education. All of the money's paid for that for yourself, your spouse, and your dependents are added together. And you can calculate the credit based on the lesser of the total of that amount or $10,000. Okay, so it's not a per person credit, it's a one taxpayer. Take 20% of the lower of those two amounts. And of course, there's always phase out. If your AGI is too high, you may not be eligible for the credit. Okay, so American Opportunity is a per student in their first four years of school. Um, eligible expenses, first $2,000 and 25% of the next $2,000 are your credit per student. Lifetime learning are for students outside of that window. Add up all the expenses of the taxpayer spouse and their dependents. The lesser of the actual expenses or 10,000 are used to compute 20%. Be careful of your AGI limitations. Okay. Courtney paid $2,000 of tuition and $300 for books for Ellen to attend the University of Missouri, Kansas City during the summer following the end of her first year. What is the maximum American Opportunity tax credit before phase out Courtney may claim for these expenses? Well, because the cost of tuition and books is an eligible expense and um, Courtney, uh, his daughter is in that first year or two, then she can take the first $2,000, 100%, and then of the next $1,000, 25%, or I'm sorry, of the next $300, 25%. So the total AOTC is 2,075. How much AOTC would Courtney have been allowed to claim under 21? tax return if she were married and filing a joint return with her husband, assuming the couple's AGI is 162,000. Well, once our income reaches 160,000, our AGI as a married filing joint, we don't get to take the entire AOTC tax credit. It phases out over a $20,000 range. So if your AGI is above 180,000, you're not allowed the AOTC credit. But in Courtney and her husband's case here, we would take the excess amount her AGI is above 160,000, which in step four you can see is $2,000, then divided by the phase out range of 20,000. So 10% of her AOTC is phased out or $208, 2075 times 10%. So, $1,867 is the amount of the American Opportunity Tax Credit. Okay, and that's how you would do the phase out for the lifetime learning credit as well. The next credit is the earned income credit, probably the tax credit most abused and the reason for identity fraud. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's stolen identities, okay? It's really a negative income tax. Okay, you get this back even if you don't have a tax liability, just totally refundable. You must have earned income to apply for it and you must have at least one qualifying child or satisfy an age requirement and not be a dependent on another person's tax return. Now they do refer us to exhibit 811, which is on page 831 of your book. And this will help us, there it is also. This will help us calculate the earned income credit. 
So what this essentially says is if you're a married filing joint person, because the table is broken down between married filing joint and everybody else. If you have no qualifying child and you are eligible for the earned income credit, your earned income credit is, okay, $1,502, item three. Subtract your AGI from 14,820. Okay, or your earned income, whichever is greater, and multiply that by 15.3%. Subtract that from number three, and that's your earned income credit. Now, as you add children, qualifying children, your income is higher. Okay, it goes up, and your earned income credit may as well. There it is for everybody else. <laughs> So that's the table you would use if you're not married filing joint. Okay, before we get, that's a brand new refundable personal credit. I'm going to refer you to page 8-32 to take a quick look at how we calculate the earned income credit. Courtney's earned income for the year is 18800 and her AGI is 170,000, blah, blah, blah. She does not qualify for any earned income. However, assume her Courtney's only source of income for the year was 30,000 in salaries, and her AGI is also 30,000. What would be Courtney's earned income credit? Well, we would use the table that is all taxpayers except married taxpayers payers filing a joint return. I'm pretty sure it says she has one qualifying child. Okay. Maybe she has two. Let's see. Oh, yeah. She has two qualifying children. I'm sorry. I forgot about Ellen. Ellen and Duran. So we would go to the row where there's two qualifying children. And it says maximum earned income eligible for credit is 14950 times 40%. So her maximum credit is 5980. Let's see if she can take all 5980. In step six, it says, what is the AGI threshold? 19,520. So we subtract the 19,520 from her 30,000 AGI slash earned income. The difference is $10,480. Multiply that difference by the 21.06%. That's the, will give us how much of that maximum credit she is not eligible for, 2207. So the earned income credit she is eligible for is the 5980 max minus the part she's not, 2207, 3773. And she just gets that all back. Okay, so that's not, oh, well, maybe you'll get it back. No, whether you have any kind of um, tax liability or not, she's getting that back. The individual recovery credit is a credit that only applies in 2021. This is brand new. It's a $1,400 credit for eligible taxpayers, $2,800 for married filing jointly, plus $1,400 for each dependent. It is subject to a phase out and you're actually allowed to get this credit now based on your 2019 or 20 tax return information. And you're not required to repay any amount you receive above what you're eligible for. But if you do receive a lower amount than you're eligible for, you can requ request the rest on your 2021 on tax return. Now, what are these phase outs? This is on page 832. So, the credit is reduced rateably for taxpayers with AGI over 75,000, 120, 12,500 for head of household, and 150,000 for married filing joint. 
and it completely phases out at 80,000 for single, 120 for head of household, and 160 for married filing joint. Okay, so you automatically get a $1,400 credit, $2,800 if you're married filing joint, and then you get $1,400 for each dependent unless your income is above those phase outs. If it is, then you start, um, and when I say income, I mean AGI, you may get partial, but once it's above that upper end of the phase out, you don't get any. The final area of our tax credits deal with business tax credits, and we're just gonna say that there are some. When you're looking at what order you should take credits, you should first deduct non-refundable personal credits. And if there's um, any that your credits are above your tax liability, you just lose them. When it comes to business you credits, you should take those second because you have the opportunity to carry back those credits or carry them forward to future tax returns. And you should take refundable credits last because they're always refundable no matter what. So you want to apply your non-refundable credits first. Final area of the chapter. What happens, what are we required to do as taxpayers and what kind of penalties are there when it comes to paying our taxes and, and um, filing them? Well, we must pay our taxes as we go or we earn the money. So this automatically happens when we are in a um, employment relationship because employers are required to withhold federal income taxes on the gross wages of an employee or gross pay. But what if you're self-employed or you have excess earnings and taxable income above your normal earnings at your job? Well, you should calculate or estimate your taxes and pay them in at certain intervals. And the due dates are April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and January 15th of the following year. So if you don't pay or pay enough in, you may be subject to underpayment penalties. There is a safe harbor provision, meaning if you pay at least 90% of your current tax liability in or 100% of last year's, then you're considered to have paid in enough. So you don't have to pay one. 100% of this year's in, just as long as you meet either of those requirements, you won't receive penalties. Now, what the IRS generally does is it divides your income up over those four payment periods and determines, did you pay enough in at each payment period? And if you didn't, then it's going to calculate a penalty for each payment time um, based on the underpayment amount. And they'll charge you penalties and interest. Um, example A27, you could see this in action. So it's showing you how much Courtney should have had withheld versus how much she actually withheld to cover her taxes and how much she was under for each quarter. And then it goes on to show how they're calculating penalties and interest on those underpayments from each quarter. You are required to file a tax return if your gross income is above a certain amount. The due dates, generally the um, fourth, 15th day of the fourth month after your tax year, normally April 15th, and you could extend it up to six months to file your tax return. But all payments of all taxes should be made by April 15th. So you don't get an extension to pay, just to file. Again, your late filing penalty. So if you don't file your tax return on time, 5% of the tax you owe per month up to 25%, and it could be higher if there's fraud involved. There's no penalty if no tax is owed as of the due date. However, your late payment penalty, if you don't pay entire tax owed by due date of your return, it's a half a percent of the tax owed for each month.
combined late filing and late payment penalties may not exceed a maximum amount. So there are you know, limits on it. So I think this is the one we're looking at. Let's see, Courtney filed her tax return on April 10th and included a check with the return for 4,037. 4,037 consisted of her underpaid tax liability of four grand and her $37 underpayment penalty. Courtney had waited until May 1st to file her return and pay her taxes. What late filing and late payment penalty would she owe? So it would have been 4,000 for the late payment times 5% times one month, $200. So she would have had an additional $200 if she just waited two weeks to file her return. Okay, so that is a quick run through of late payments and um, how we penalize them and have interest and late filing. So a lot of stuff covered here. We had um, in the beginning of the chapter, additional taxes, and then we had tax credits, and then we had um, the late filing and late payment information. So please make sure you ask any and all questions you might have related to this chapter.